So good evening, everyone. My name is May Khalil. Um, I am the Africa ambassador in Abu Dhabi. And today my forward is going to be about uh, microcosmic the Nahda, May Ziyad as Salon as a hybrid uh, space from Journal Arabic, from Journal of Arabic Literature. So my topic is an article that discusses the intellectual circles, also known as the Salon of Lebanese Palestinian poet, essayist and translator May Ziyada. Uh, this article originally appeared in the Journal of Arabic Literature in January 2010. The author is Dr. Busein Al-Khalidi, who is a professor of Arabic and comparative literature at the American University of Sharjah. Her main research interests are, not, uh, are and not restricted to Al-Nahda, post-colonial literature, women's literary production, and pre-modern anthologies. Later on, this article was added to the author's book, Egypt Awakening in the Early 20th Century. So let's talk about May Ziada and how I came across this article. Uh, May Elias Ziada was a Lebanese Palestinian poet, essayist, and translator who wrote different works in Arabic and in French. She wrote for Arabic newspapers and periodicals, along with publishing poems and books. She was born in Al Nasra in Palestine in 1886. She was well known to have shared correspondence with Khalil Gibran, uh, which started in 1912 and lasted for 20 years. Uh, keeping this number of years in mind, they never really met. So that was basically my main reason why I got curious about the topic to learn more about their story. And I started reading more about Meziada. Then the Afikra team helped me in finding this source. Uh, so the article is 40 page long, but um, the author um, draws um, like an extensive amount of material supported by a theoretical framework that helps in envisioning the salon as a public sphere. From my side, I just, saw, I just chose some interesting parts, which I'll be presenting a forward on. So uh, let's get started. Uh, just to give you like a little context on Al Nahda, uh, and it was uh, referred as Arab Awakening or Enlightenment. It was a cultural movement that flourished mainly in Egypt, Lebanon, and Syria during the second half of the 19th century and the early 20th century. Meziada was a key figure of Al Nahda, especially in the Arab literary scene. She was also known for being a, um, an early feminist and a pioneer of Oriental feminism. So if we talk about May Ziada's Salon, it played an important role in the 20th century Nahda in Egypt. The author states in this article that May Ziada was so heavily invested in the project more than she was recognized. So not much credit has been given to this space, even though it had a great influence on important um, intellectuals who are usually associated with the Nahda, like for example, Taha Hussain. Uh, the author attempts in this article to provide a full picture of the space, the history, the nature of the salon, the attendees, and rituals. And according to Taha Hussain, who was an Azhari Sheikh at the time, he was a regular attendee at her salon as well. He says, uh, May revives by this salon a long-established Arab practice, just as she transfers to Egypt a long-established European practice, ancient and modern. So the idea of initiating a salon of her own probably came from the fact that um, there was a need for an intellectual gathering for both men and women at the time. The author also mentions public spaces like Al Halmiya, Bab Al Khalq, and Al Fishawi, which were all spaces for intellectuals, but were missing female audiences and contributors. Uh, another impact that the salon had was the sense of recognition for the new word salon that accompanied the intercultural and hybrid nature of the Nahda. So more terms were also introduced, such as majlis, uh, we have nadwa, um, we have also salon and nadi. So if we, we come to think of the, like, the physical space of the salon, uh, Ziada held her salon in her parents' house in Cairo, firstly at Muslim Pasha Street, then moved to bigger apartments to accommodate more guests over the years. Now, this point brings us to these photos here, the, the one of like, Google Maps and the, the building on the, on the left. So basically, this was my own research, not related to the article, but um, I was just curious to see if um, any of these apartments were preserved or maybe at least just are present um, right now. And unfortunately, they're not. So the gas station, if you can see on the left, is the, was the exact location of the building where Meziada used to host her salon from 1934 to 36. 
And on the right, I went on Google Maps and did some search. Um, you can see that the location uh, is uh, on Rushdi Street or Rushdi Basha Street, which, is, which was an extension of Muslim Pasha Street. Um, now, if we talk about the frequency of these intellectual circles, they happened every Tuesday for 23 years, from 1913 to 1936. People would join to read their own poetry, they would listen to musical performances, they would debate major and political issues of the day. This salon attracted supporters of a variety of cultural, literary, and philosophical movements. Uh, Mahmoud Abbas al aqad who was a regular attendee, he mentioned uh, 30 regular attendees in his books, and I'm just going to mention a couple. So we had Amir al-Shu'ara, who's like the Prince of Poets, Ahmed Shawqi. We had Lebanese poet and journalist Khalil Motran, Anton Jmail, who was the senior editor of Al-Ihram at the time. We have Dawood Barakat, who was the Egyptian calligrapher of the King of Egypt at the time. Um, Egyptian activist Huda Sha'rawi and activist as well Ihsan al Kousi. We have Taha Hussein and um, Egyptian woman writer Malak Hafni Nasif. So as you can see, like the, the salon brought together a wide range of intellectuals from different social backgrounds, political orientations, and religious affiliations. Maizia disregarded social status and encouraged socializing between the sexes by including both intellectual and non-intellectual female figures in her salon. Her salon was a stopover for Azhari sheikhs, for Christians and atheists. So now we come to the actual tour of Meziada's salon. Um, the moment like you enter, just imagine entering Meziada's house and the moment you enter it, you would find like this um, huge epigram by Imam Shafi'i that advises people to restrain their tongues in order to sustain their well-being and the respect of others. So I'm just going to read it in Arabic. إذا شئت أن تحيا سليما من الأذى وحظك موفور وعرضك سيّن لسانك لا تذكر به عورة امرئ فكلك عورات وللناس ألسن وعينك إن أبدت إليك معايب فصنها وقل يا عين للناس أعين وعاشر بمعروف وسامح من اعتدى وفارق ولكن بلته هي أحسن. These lines establish a code of ethics against slander and abuse. They invite and also impose politeness. So we go to the living room of the salon. So it had a huge library as well. It was loaded with books of Turath, Arabic heritage, compendiums, anthologies, and books in foreign languages. And I quote from the author, the paintings on the living room wall, the Eastern furniture, and the music room next to the living room with its Eastern and Western instruments attested to the salonier's specific fondness for modernity and tradition. All of these factors, paintings, furniture, books, and musical instruments helped create an atmosphere conductive to discussion. And if you talk about the dynamics of the salon, um, she kept hospitality to its minimal requirements of ref refreshments. She used to offer her guests rose water, coffee or tea in cold days, and some Eastern and Western sweets. And this is an interesting part where the author compares the salon to the Blue Stocking Society, which was a literary society led by Elizabeth Montago in, 19, in 17, sorry, uh, 1750s in England. And I quote that their guests feed their minds and not their bodies. So um, if we talk about the Salon as an institution, the author mentions that the Salon's literature and correspondence were as enriching as Maziada's publications, if not more. That's when she argues that the Salon should be conceived as an institution that addressed public opinion. And I quote, her articles as well as those of her attendees testify to a space of great interaction with other institutions like the academia at which she lectured or listened to lectures. So the salon was held for 20 years every Tuesday evening. It had regular attendees, both men and women, who were committed and used to travel from different areas to attend. There was also the sense of salon's unspoken code of laws, which was if any of her attendees just missed the Tuesday assembly, they had to apologize formally by writing or by phone. So the attendees, as you can see, were very punctual. The salon was not organized to pass time, relax after a working day. It was a very serious working space, which its main purpose was to instruct. 
And just to keep the topic light, um, according to the poet Ismail Sabri, he expressed how Tuesday has a special meaning that becomes associated with May Ziada. And I quote, if I do not gratify my eye with May, may your morning not come to your Tuesday. Uh, some of the salon's key features uh, were um, there was no space in it for petty or personal disputes. The gathering assumed an identity that was neither Egyptian nor Syrian, but cultural within the Nahda aspiration. Ziada did not control the discussion agenda of attendees. Her salon um, regular attendees made suggestions for topics to be discussed in the salon. And lastly, we come to the end. So like, how did it end um, in 1936? Um, Ziada did not, I mean, close her salon, even though, I mean, her dearest family members passed away, like her father, uh, Jubran Khalil Jubran as well, and some of her regular attendees. But actually the main reason why the salon ended was because of her mother's death. Now, um, it really took a toll on May Ziada uh, because of, not, not really because of their close relationship, but because her mom was, um, her mother attended her salon sessions. So on the social level, it was inappropriate and even scandalous for her to hold her salon without the presence of a family member back then. And the author mentions later that she began to hold meetings by appointment. Now, the whole situation, the emotional distress, the sense of loneliness and loss, and the, the inability to communicate as freely as before weighed heavily on May Ziada. That's when she wrote a letter to her cousin in Paris, uh, Joseph Ziada, to explain her tragic situation. And surprisingly, her cousin, maybe driven by greed um, and the idea that when women are alone, they are liable to hysteria and madness. So he admitted her to Asfuria mental asylum in Lebanon. But later on, due to her friend's intervention, they moved her to a hospital and diagnosed her madness to be just mere depression. Um, later on, her friend Amini Rehani, Lebanese American writer at the time, rented a villa and freaking Lebanon to take care of her. Uh, May Ziada passed away in 1941 after returning to Egypt. So um, we come to the end of my presentation. Thank you for listening so much. Um, I've added a couple of sources that you can check out to learn more about May Ziada. We have uh, the letters of May Ziada. We've got a documentary as well, super, super cool. We have um, the letters uh, written between Jibran Khalil and May Ziada, Blue Flame. And we have the Nahda book written by Bufain Al Khalidi. So thank you so much for listening. These are my contact details. You can message me anytime, talk about that, figure out other things. Thank you.